Hello and welcome to Japan Expert Insights and our Business Insights Forum. Every Thursday, Tim Sullivan and I, Mai Matsuoka, lead a discussion looking for insights, developments, and new opportunities for the business in Japan. In this podcast, we welcome comments, questions, and opinions. So if you haven't done so yet, join us next time. In the meantime, you can find us at japanexpertinsights.com and our YouTube channel, where we upload all the discussions on Japanese politics, business insights, and the Japan's role in the Indo-Pacific region. Good morning, everybody. Thank you. I know we know it's early or maybe late for some people. It depends on where you are. Thank you for attending. And uh, good morning, Frank. Good morning. So today we've got Renga once again. And I'm sure that uh, many people know him already, but uh, one thing which I didn't know actually until uh, last week is that uh, Ren is a member of the Philadelphia Orchestra's Ambassador Circle. And uh, well, as such, of course, uh, he has uh, a lot of amazing stories uh, which uh, he, can, he can share with us. So in fact, a couple of months, or maybe it was uh, several months ago, I listened to one of the rooms he was uh, talking in it's about uh, music and uh, there uh, it was also about uh, the philadelphia orchestra and i listened to ren's uh, um well story about the orchestra there and how the orchestra has managed to, to survive through the centuries and also through crises and uh, well there are several things which were very impressive at that time and so um, i'm very grateful Ren, to you that you agreed to do um, a similar talk today so that more people can um, listen to it and hopefully, um, well, draw some uh, ideas and uh, also lessons of uh, how we can go forward by building a community and uh, creating mutual benefits for uh, both uh, the orchestra and uh, the community as well. So shall we start? Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Maya. Thank you, Timothy. As always, um, for for giving me the opportunity to share some of the things that I enjoy the most in my life. And thank you for the audience to uh, coming coming to this room to to listen to, uh, well, listen to my speech, <laughs> but not music. Uh, but you are going to see a lot of uh, links in that um, URL uh, that Maya has put up uh, there for us. If you click through some of those, you, you can enjoy the uh, beautiful sound from this orchestra. Um, and uh, I think we're going to uh, dive uh, right into this. Um, I think, uh, with your permission, uh, Maya uh, Timothy, I think I'd like to uh, talk more about, um, about the orchestra and its relationship with the city and uh, you know, uh, if if the, the orchestra does not exist, the Philadelphia, the city is is greatly uh, boring uh, <laughs> to many people. Um, and why an orchestra, uh, just an orchestra, some people may say, uh, but why this orchestra became such an important um, jewel, uh, treasure, uh, and everyday life for the citizens of the city maybe interesting enough to talk a little bit more about that connection. And of course, we're going to talk a little bit about the, the music, why this is such a great orchestra in terms of the musicality. Uh, but uh, I think I, I think your your interest is more on the, fo on, on the connection with the people in the city and the history of that. So uh, if that's okay with you, uh, I would like to uh, briefly talk about the, uh, uh, the unique character of this orchestra in terms of the sound it produces and uh, the unique position in the history of classical music and the uh, rich history of it, uh, more like a warm-up session uh, through these two sessions and then get into the, the real um, interesting part of its commitment to the community and uh, how uh, the community is supporting the orchestra in return. And would that, would that be a good way to, to, to go through this okay. session? Sounds perfect. Good, good. Thank you. So um, the first thing is, uh, well, I think last week you, uh, you gave me another opportunity uh, to talk about the city of Philadelphia, which 
some um, some Japanese people call it uh, the Kyoto of of the U.S. and and that the fact that this city was founded by William Penn, uh, uh, who came to to Philadelphia as a Quaker. Uh, I think we talked uh, in, in the 17th century. I think we talked a little bit about the unique uh, things that he did, which was building a city that is the first uh, religiously religious tolerating city in the human history on Earth. Uh, that was the founding um, principle of of the United States, and that tradition you can still feel that in this city and. Uh, Philadelphia Orchestra is not an exception of that, and so, for example, um, I think uh, I think let me, let me check the name. Yeah, here, in 1930, a uh, female musician, uh, she was a harpist called Edna Phillips, became the first woman to be hired by a major American orchestra, uh, which was the Philadelphia Orchestra. So before 1930, you are not going to see any female player. On the stage playing in the orchestra and Philadelphia Orchestra was the first to do that and this I would argue that this has something to do with William Penn's openness I mean the city of Philadelphia you feel the openness I, and I'm, I'm going to sidetrack here a little bit here but uh, I live in the city I live in Philadelphia uh, area for 28 years I know uh, some friends in Japan, I know they say, oh, hey, Ren, you are American now. You live in the U.S. Don't you have this discrimination issue? And I'm happy to tell my friends that in my 28 years of life in Philadelphia, honestly, I never felt that. Maybe in other cities, but in Philadelphia, no. And so this openness of Philadelphia uh, hired this female player in 1930s. And how significant is this, right? Uh, if you think about uh, another orchestra, a great orchestra like the Vienna Philharmonic. The first, the first time they accepted women to be on the stage to play with the orchestra was 1997. So, uh, well, that's about 67 years later than the Philadelphia. So in, the, in many sense, Philadelphia Orchestra is very uh, innovative, revolutionary, and did many things that other orchestras have not done. And, and very uh, 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 frontier-spirited orchestra. And that would be some of the history that we will be covering. And then, uh, like I said, that's a warm-up session, but I want to make sure my warm-up session doesn't take more than 15 minutes, so I'm going to continue. So, the first part, the unique character of the orchestra. Uh, there's a, uh, in the classical uh, industry, uh, classical music uh, industry or, or field, we have something called the fabulous Philadelphia sound, Philadelphia sound. and. There is a great article uh, that covers what Philadelphia sound means in Japanese by Japan's Kajimoto, uh, which is a company that uh, invites uh, foreign orchestras to or foreign artists to come to Japan to, to, to perform for the Japanese audience. Um, they had a special report in three parts about the history of the Philadelphia sound. And I, uh, for those who read Japanese, um, the links are in the uh, note.com site. Uh, up there and and in fact there are only two phrases that are associated with sound uh, so in addition to Philadelphia sound the other one is called Karayan sound and we all we know uh, Herbert von Karajan how famous he is uh, so there are only two sounds in classical music um, and so you can see why Philadelphia sound is so distinct uh, distinctive and the, the reason the Philadelphia sound is so distinctive is if you are you can actually hear this uh, in the recording as well, but if you go to the live performance, you can feel the, the, the very warm, intensive, its intensity. And, and I can even feel the, 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 the air wave coming from the string section. It's really uh, lush string sound. Um, this is the tradition of Philadelphia Orchestra. Uh, it, it is... Uh, it is loud, <laughs> it is very powerful sound, but it's not harsh. Uh, I don't know how to describe this, but uh, uh, maybe you can uh, listen to their string section sound with the recording uh, that I also uh, put up here on the URL, uh, which is Tchaikovsky's Strings Serenade. So it, it's uh, and I play violin myself. So the first time I encountered the Philadelphia string sound, I, I was shocked, uh, to be honest. Um, so 
So that is a good recording uh, for, for, for you to try. And where did this sound come from? And there are many uh, mysteries to this. Um, and, and this is probably the right time for me to say that everything I say here is just my own opinion. Uh, the Philadelphia Orchestra did not ask me to speak for them. <laughs> so none of the ideas expressed in this uh, uh, talk or in my, in my website uh, is supported or endorsed in any manner by any organization or, or any person other than myself. And so with that clear, disclaimer uh, clear, um, and maybe it's, it's also worthwhile to mention why I am a member of the ambassador circle. And, and there are certain levels of circles of the, what we, uh, to, for the better, for the lack of a better word, uh, fan club, if you will. And of course you have to make donations. And I have been a subscriber of the Philadelphia Orchestra since 1993. Um, and so, so I think they, they, they let me join this circle. Um, and then ambassador circle members are, uh, are asked to speak about the, the orchestra whenever there's opportunity to, to, to spread the, the, the great tradition of the Philadelphia Orchestra. So, so again, thank you, Maya and Timothy, for me to, to continue speaking about this, this orchestra. But I'm just speaking from my, my heart, not from somebody's instruction. Um, so let me continue where I left. Um, the unique sound, where did it come from? Um, the, the, believe it or not, this orchestra, so famous, but they did not have a home. They did not have a symphony hall. Uh, there are so many symphony halls in, the, in Japan, great acoustics. The Santori Hall is the best one in the world, some people call it. Uh, I like the Tokyo Bunka, Bunka Kaikan sound better, but there are great halls in, the, in Japan. But in Philadelphia, there was no symphony hall until year 2001. So Philadelphia Orchestra had to play in the oldest opera house in the US that was built that was opened in 1857, I remember. And that opera house is called Academy of Music. And I, I put some photos there, you can click that, and it's, it, it's beautiful, right? But the thing is, the acoustics is not so good. It is not a symphony hall. It is an opera house. So the air is very dry. In fact, Herbert von Kalayan came, came, to, came to Philadelphia. He says something about, you know, this hall kind of, <laughs> the, there's no there's no echo, there's no residual sound, so the 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 sound is too dry. So Philadelphia Orchestra had been uh, tortured, if you will, suffered, uh, has been suffering uh, to 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 play in this uh, not so ideal, beautiful opera house for one hundred years, from so nineteen hundred to two thousand. So they had to do something. Uh, more more unique. They have to get the sound out to 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 somebody sitting in the in the last row of the highest floor, and this is a tall hall. It I think has four floors. So they they were trained to have more beautiful vibrato, uh, get the air, get the sound out, without making the sound too harsh, and and that became the hallmark of Philadelphia sound. And there are other reasons, but this is the this is one of the reasons most mostly talked about. So when this orchestra came to uh, came to Suntory Hall with great acoustics, that really overwhelmed people's um, ear uh, because it's so rich. The sound is so rich; it's like eating a really thick steak, um, a very juicy steak. And that's the Philadelphia sound, in my opinion, and that I just defined it uh, by myself. Um, and then after year two thousand one. Uh, they moved to uh, Verizon Hall inside Kimo Center for the performing arts. And this hall finally has the acoustics that this orchestra deserves after 100 years, even though this orchestra is such a famous orchestra. Um, so it's, it's interesting. Um, and some people worry about, hey, you know, if you move to this uh, great uh, acoustics hall, uh, maybe the tradition will disappear or well, not. Not really, uh, because uh, the way they play sticked uh, and the um, the association with Curtis Institute which is one of the most uh, highly uh, competitive uh, music conservatory in the world um, is connected with the Philadelphia Orchestra so so this tradition will continue and I, I still hear Philadelphia sound from the 1960s recording and today's a live play a live performance so um, so now they play in the, the Verizon Hall. 
Okay, so um, besides the great, unique, rich sound they produce, uh, let's talk a little bit about the unique programming uh, that makes this orchestra uh, unique, uh, standing, stand out. Um, each season, uh, the orchestra has a special focus, and uh, there, there, you know, this orchestra was built, was, was founded in 1900, so we have uh, basically 121 years now. Um, each year, I, I, I decided to pick two years, two seasons, as, as an example. Uh, one, the first one, is the 1994 to 1995 season. Uh, they uh, they focused on the music composed at Trezen, which is a Jewish concentration camp in uh, former Czechoslovakia. And many talented Jewish musicians, the composers, the violin players, they were all sent there. And then the, the Nazis uh, actually had an uh, orchestra in Trezen uh, concentration camp. And they shot the video, they, the propaganda to show to the world that, hey, you know, we are, not, we are treating Jewish people really well. They are enjoying their life. They are playing music. But in fact, uh, 33,000 uh, Jewish people died in prison, and 88,000 uh, Jewish people were later sent to the killing sites around the, the Germany or even Poland, Auschwitz. Um, so the Philadelphia uh, decided, orchestra decided to pay the tri tribute uh, to the musicians in Trezen. Uh, so we program the Sound of the uh, uh, Forgotten, uh, should have been better played, more, more oftenly played, uh, composition by someone like Pavel Haas, and he had a composition called Study for String, and, uh, and that was a, a very uh, moving uh, performance. And interesting enough, uh, NHK, uh, Japan's broadcasters, they had a um, special documentary about this same topic, and it's called Shu Kyosei Shuyojo no Maestro Tachi, and uh, this is a uh, this is something you can um, view on, on demand. Um, but I get there were so many great musicians in that concentration camp, and I am proud that uh, that Philadelphia Orchestra uh, did this um, that no other orchestras did, um, and we certainly in the city of Philadelphia, the people in Philadelphia certainly learn a lot more about what went through uh, the Jewish community and Jewish musicians during those days. And, uh, and what, what a marvelous uh, creation, uh, the music they were able to do in such condition. So this is a good example because, you know, some people say, uh, some orchestra may do, oh, uh, let's celebrate a Jewish uh, culture and then they play some famous Jewish composers, um, posi uh, composition, Mahler, most, most uh, popular ones. Uh, that's fine, I, I, like, I like Mahler's as well, but what Philadelphia, how Philadelphia does is one step farther, deeper into the history, to really uh, uh, bring out the, the, the real part of, um, of the history and let you, let someone like myself, who doesn't know anything about history, especially the Jewish people's life, uh, experience through those days in their concentration camp, maybe just a little bit through their music. And I really appreciate that. And, that, and I think a lot of uh, citizens in Philadelphia appreciate that as well. The second example of such uh, focused theme of a season is a recent one, uh, 2019 to 2020 season. Um, the, uh, we, uh, we put female artists center stage. Um, we invited more um, female conductors. Uh, we also play some of the female uh, composers' music. We think the female musicians are underrepresented in the, I, I, should, I shouldn't say we, I think, and many of the people uh, feel the same way, that the female musicians are underrepresented in the in many in many uh, fields, including the classical music, um, so the orchestra decided to 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 do this. And one uh, example is uh, uh, largely uh, a largely forgotten black woman composer. Uh, her name is Florence Price. She composed a, a beautiful symphony number no. three. Um, 
and uh, uh, that uh, her symphony was not only performed but also recorded. You can actually purchase the CD or, or download uh, through through, uh, through the website, and I put up um, the the link to to do this. And I don't think her music was ever played in Japan. So I have encouraged some of my classical music friends to do this to play uh, Florence Price uh, symphonies in Japan because you are going to be the one who premiere her <laughs> her, her composition in Japan, and you you could be uh, you know. Uh, on, the, on the history book, right? So I, I recommended this to, to my friends. So let me stop here for any other questions you may have um, about the, the unique character of the orchestra. Yeah, you know, Ren, I, I always learn so much when I listen to you and I am not the most cultured guy in the world. So you raise, you always raise my level of culture when I, when I listen to you. And, uh, you know, if somebody had said to me, what is the most progressive city in America in terms, in terms of inclusiveness? I probably would have guessed San Francisco. And now I listen to you and you're telling me it's Philadelphia. And I believe you, it makes total sense. Um, so that, that, that's fascinating. And I, I, I actually text, texted my behind the scenes. I said, for a future room, that would be a great topic because right now inclusion is a really hot term and a hot item. And I think everybody who with a sense of fairness and compassion supports inclusion. But to me, the topic would be something like inclusion, the Philadelphia model. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because I think we can learn so much just listening to you. And one, one more thing I just wanted to mention, I'll let you continue. So, you know, you, you highlighted that there is a, maybe not even uh, conscious, but there's definitely a gender bias, right? There has been historically and as fate would have it, I read, it's one of Malcolm Gladwell's books. I can't remember if it's The Outliers or if it's Blink, I don't remember, but he was talking about, I think it was New York, the orchestra. And they just noticed that it was dominated by men and they wanted to overcome the bias. And they were assuming that the bias wasn't intentional. You know, people who claim to be progressive often are proven in psychological tests that they still have that that bias and, and they don't want to have it, but they have it. So the what what the orchestra did was they started auditioning people and without knowing who they were their names and they auditioned them behind a curtain so nobody knew if it was a man or a woman and by doing so they were kind of combining inclusion and meritocracy into a single technique and it helped you know i don't remember the details but it helped balance out that bias so I thought that point that you made about Philadelphia being way ahead of the curve was, was really interesting. Thank you. It's, uh, it's called blind audition or blind tasting, if you will. <laughs> um, uh, yes, that's, uh, that's my, my, my daughter uh, is a violin player. So I, I really appreciate this uh, openness, um, inclusion, uh, and which is an important topic for me as well. Hello, hello, hello Frank. Oh. Hi, morning. Good morning. Um, just a really quick thanks, Ren. I mean, I, I, first of all, just to say really quickly, um, if I'd seen a talk on Philadelphia and its orchestra, um, it's probably not something I would have joined. I'm joining today because of the the way you tell your stories. It's uh, it's I, I, I really enjoy the the, uh, the the passion and the and, and the imagery that you bring to the to the stories that that, that you tell. And um, my a really quick comment on a different topic from what Tim was just talking about there, and it's about the, the comment you made about how the sound of the orchestra has been affected so much by the the physical the physical space that they were in and just to recommend a book to, to you and to any 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 of the uh, other participants who are interested in this sort of thing um there's a book by david byrne from the talking heads called how music works and he talks exactly about that sort of thing about how physical space and then you know electronics um and and, and other things have affected the way music sounds over the years um and i think may, maybe maybe he even talks about um about, about the uh, the venue you just talked about there but it's a really great book for anyone interested in this sort of thing Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. And that's why we, we go to the live performance instead of listening to, to CDs or down, uh, uh, streaming, right? Because the musicians actually adapt the way they play depending on the, the hall, the condition they were in. So that's, that makes the uh, unique experience, uh, once a life experience uh, at that particular moment. Thank you, Frank. And, and I will just continue uh, 
uh, quickly about the, the 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 strong leadership from the uh, the music directors. Uh, uh, these these are great directors, music directors. I'm not even qualified to talk about them, but I'm going to just uh, tell you what some of the things they did. Uh, I think the the Philadelphia Orchestra is becoming famous since 1912 when the Leopold Stokowski uh, became the music director. And, and the interesting thing about him is he is a relentless innovator. He was from the UK. He knew he knew the American orchestras do not have the the luxury of the tradition. Of uh, compared to the European orchestras, like you know, very few harmonic of Vienna. So he, and I think this is important for people, uh, business people like us as well. If I don't have that, what do I have, right? So what uh, Stokowski found, uh, identified was innovation. America is a country of innovation and uh, frontier spirit. So he did many things that other orchestras did not do. For example, he did something called free bowing. He told the string players. Just bow how you feel, you know. But other orchestra, everybody has to follow up, up bow, down bow, like a machine. But he let the players do whatever they, they, they feel like. So he created this uh, waves of sound that is what I call slush sp uh, string sound. And he also did something, uh, left to right violins. I don't know the exact music term, but usually when you look at the orchestra on the stage, you have a first violin on the left and then second violin and viola and cello. So what he did is he he put the first violin on the left and the second violin on the right, and you're going to see some 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 performances being uh, 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 the the seating arrangement to be done this way, and that started by Leo, Leo, Leopold Stokowski with Philadelphia Orchestra, and he also asked the brass instruments to do more uh, vibrato. Uh, <laughs> before him, the, the brass player, brass uh, brass instrument player, they just sh shoot the sound straight, uh, but Stokowski did this, so that is also another unique Philadelphia sound. And he also uh, did not follow the <laughs> composer's scores uh, as is. He would, uh, he would change the tempo when he feels the excitement is reaching. It's almost improvising uh, 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 because the Philadelphia orchestra players are so skillful. He was able to push or apply more speed and then hit the brake, like those, those kind of things. Uh, and so that, that, that's what, uh, what Philadelphia and, uh, Philadelphians and Stokowski did since 1912. And of course, he's also famous for orchestration. He, he, he orchestrated the Bach uh, organ music to orchestra music. And the most famous of which is the, uh, the first opening of the Fantasia, uh, the, fu the first one. And that's also uh, conducted by him with Philadelphia Orchestra and his own uh, orchestration score. Um, and then the second music director is a, a gentleman uh, from Hungary called Eugene Ormandy. And uh, uh, 44 years as a music director, this is unprecedented in uh, classical music history. He's a true craftsmanship, uh, very focused on, on the details. Again, I feel uh, humble to even talk about, about these conductors. But in 1980s, uh, an Italian conductor called Riccardo Muti, uh, he's very charis charismatic and brilliant uh, conductor, very dramatic because he's operatic uh, background. Uh, I came to Philadelphia and that was 1980s. And in 1993, uh, that's when I came to Philadelphia, um, a German conductor from München, uh, Munich, called Wolfgang Savalisch, who conducted the uh, NHK Symphony very often. So I, I saw him playing NHK Symphony uh, when I was uh, in, in, in middle school and high school in Japan. So I feel kind of connected to him. Same, same year, came to Philadelphia. The musicians loved him. Musicians, they call him musicians, musician. Uh, when they wanted to choose a new music director in 1993, the orchestra members voting as the first choice was him. It was unanimously voted. Never heard of this. Uh, this something never heard of. It. And this is actually the third time he was invited. He was invited by Obandi uh, twice, but he was uh, the, the music director and also general manager of the Bavarian, Bavarian uh, State Opera House in München. And so he couldn't come to Philadelphia. So when he was asked the third time in 1993 with a unanimous vote, he and he was 70 years old, he, he came. And in 1993, he took the orchestra to Japan, and this is a, there's a Japan tour video. I re the reason I put that video there is because to many orchestra members, uh, it was their last tour to Japan. Uh, Savalish knew the orchestra needed to have a young, uh, new blood. So the current Philadelphia Orchestra's players were all, uh, mostly, most of them, the majority of them were replaced during Savalish years. And I think the, um, even though many uh, players voted for him, 
but they were replaced after Savalic came, and a lot of players uh, were, uh, were willing to do that for the future of the orchestra. And so there's a new generation video. You can see how these new generation players admire him, loved him so much in this uh, documentary video, which is about five minutes long. And then Savalic retired, and we had uh, Christopher Eschenbach uh, from Poland, born in Poland, but mostly in Germany. And he championed uh, young artists, um, and, and, and most famously uh, René Fleming, the soprano, and then the Chinese pianist called Lan Lan, who was attending uh, Curtis uh, just down the street. And then uh, Asian Park uh, uh, had to had to uh, had some issues, so uh, the orchestra had to find an interim chief conductor, uh, Charles de Troyes. Uh, he was a Swiss. Many people think he's French, but he's actually a Swiss. Um, he was in Montreal Symphony and also came to uh, came to NHK often. Uh, his uh, orchestra color and lyricism, especially the French and Russian music, uh, was was very matching to the orchestra until uh, until the orchestra found the next and the current music director called Yannick Nezesegan, a Canadian uh, from Quebec, speaks. French, of course, uh, and he's a great choir conductor as well. Uh, he was a student of Joseph uh, Flammerfeld in uh, uh, in uh, in a choir college, Westminster Choir College in uh, in Princeton, New Jersey. A famous choir conductor. So Yannick is great choir conductor. So he programmed many orchestra choir masterpieces like Verdi's Requiem, and we also enjoy that uh, the orchestra choir pieces. And then in two thousand sixteen. In 2015, I was in Japan, and an orchestra came to Japan with Yannick, and then a big news came. The Metropolitan Opera House in New York decided to uh, have Yannick as the next uh, music director. And this was announced in Tokyo. So, uh, so Yannick is now uh, both the Philadelphia Orchestra and also Metropolitan Opera's uh, music director at the same time. Um, you can see the YouTube uh, video of the uh, a press release uh, uh, that from Yannick's hotel in Japan and the management team from the Metropolitan Opera. And I actually went to the uh, backstage of the concert uh, when the day when this was announced uh, in Tokyo in Suntory Hall and, and congratulated him. And then I just I put, a, put a picture there uh, uh, for your uh, uh, consumption uh, for what, 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 uh, whatever it would be worthy. Um, so that's the music director's uh, history. And then I would highly recommend a, a, a documentary film uh, called Music from the Inside Out. Uh, that was uh, shot in 2004. Uh, this covered each uh, um, several important uh, several players in the orchestra about their life, how they look at the music, and why they are able to, to, to the secret of the, the Philadelphia Orchestra uh, was documented in this film. Uh, it was also well received in Japan, I understand. Um, so uh, just to wrap up this part, um, the innovation, this orchestra is very innovative. Um, it's the first orchestra to make electrical recording in 1925. Uh, it performed its own commercially uh, sponsored radio broadcast in 1929 on NBC. Uh, it's also the first orchestra to perform on the soundtrack of a feature film in Paramount's The Big Broadcast in 1937. He appeared on a national television broadcast in 1948 on CBS, and it's also the first cybercast, live cybercast of a concert on the internet in 1997. So there, there are so many firsts with this orchestra, um, and uh, I'm going to uh, get into the, the rich history of this orchestra uh, right after this. Um, uh, let me see, I wanna watch the clock carefully. Uh, I'm going to just hit a few highlights. The this uh, orchestra um, uh, is uh, has a unique connection with the uh, Carnegie Hall, and uh, the uh, the archive director Gino Francesconi uh, had a like three or four minutes uh, of video introducing its connection, and the video is there for you to take a look at. Uh, but the, it's, it's maybe suffice to say uh, several important milestones of the. Um, the Carnegie Hall, which was about to be demolished in 1966 or something, right? Philadelphia Orchestra was always there for them. Uh, you can take a look at that video. And then the special, another special connection 
the Philadelphia Orchestra has is with the Russian composer Rachmaninoff. Um, uh, there's a, a long article about it, and I also put up there. But uh, the point here is uh, the Rachmaninoff consider this orchestra the finest orchestra. He said, "The finest orchestra I have ever heard at any time or any place in my whole life." Well, I'm sure some of uh, our friends will not agree with him. Uh, people, some people think Vienna or Berlin, or, or in my case, I think Amsterdam Concertgebouw Orchestra is also very good. Uh, but Rachmaninoff, uh, everybody is entitled to have their own opinion, <laughs> and uh, Rachmaninoff certainly has his, his own view as well. And he recorded his uh, piano concertos with the orchestra as a pianist. He also recorded his third symphony and tom poem, The Isle of the Dead, and the vocalist as a conductor. And he dedicated his last tom poem, Symphonic Dances, to the orchestra. Um, so there's a um, the sound of the guest conductors coming to Philadelphia, they said that when they conduct the Philadelphia Orchestra with Rachmaninoff's uh, music, they can feel Rachmaninoff's ghost when they are conducting this orchestra. So this uh, Rachmaninoff's music blood is, is in, in, their, in their blood, and to, to, to listen to they play Rachmaninoff is really a, a very special moment. Um, and then the most exciting part of the history, in my opinion, is they are the first Western Orchestra to visit People's Republic of China in 1973. And there's an <clears throat> episode about this, and I want to share this with, with you. The uh, music director, uh, uh, Eugene Omani, he wanted to play the the Beethoven's Fate Symphony, you know, Symphony Number no. Five, ba -ba -ba you know. That he, he, he was ready for that. He, he took the orchestra, he rehearsed in Philadelphia, and he came to uh, came to, to 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 China. And then the the in, in in those days, the person who was in charge of all the cultural activities is the wife of Mao Zedong, the Madame Mao, and she after the orchestra came to China. Okay, after they came to China, she said. No, I don't want to listen to that. I want to listen to uh, Pastoral Symphony, which is Symphony Number no. Six. And so she said, change the program because I don't believe fate. There's no such things as fate. I don't like it. I like the pastoral better. And then the oh, <laughs> the music director Omandi says, well, I don't like that symphony, that pastoral symphony. I hate that symphony. I won't play it. Uh, I don't even have the scores for the Sixth Symphony. So it was a crisis. Uh, it was meant to be a new friendship after Nixon's, uh, you know, meeting with uh, uh, with with, with uh, Mao Zedong. So this thing was about to blow up. Then a young, very talented American diplomat called Nicholas Platt, he became the hero. He started making things up. He first approached uh, Maestro um, Omani. He said, "Well, Maestro, you know, the." Uh, I'm quoting the exact words he said to, to Omandi. Maestro, the current regime in China came to power through a peasant revolution, and the pastoral is all about peasantry. A big storm comes up in the fourth movement. They think that's the revolution. And then there's a very beautiful, peaceful, triumphant, quiet ending, which they regard as the triumph of the Communist Party. He made this up, but it worked. So Omandi said, well, when in Rome, we will do as the Romans wish, but you have to get me the score by tomorrow, because tomorrow is the concert day. So, miraculously, uh, they were able to find some uh, Symphony Number no. Six uh, scores, orchestra scores in in Shanghai, in Beijing, and they were able to somehow put them together. But there were not enough scores for all the music, all the orchestra players. So they had to, they had to do handwriting of the score, and the players struggled to follow the handwritten scores. Um, and some of them were even uh, uh, written in German. Um, and then, um, so they, so it was going to be a disaster. But it, and they didn't have time to rehearse or practice. But they were able to uh, make uh, mental connections as they went along in China, and this uh, became the historic performance of, uh, of uh, at any level in the classical music history, uh, introducing um, Western music to the, to the Chinese friends. And so the crisis was averted by this young, talented uh, diplomat. What a smart guy. He was, he was smart enough to know when to make things up. <laughs> uh, and then 
but interesting thing is is um, that uh, uh, Madame Mao, uh, why he wanted pa uh, pastoral, uh, later people found out that he watched and loved Disney Fantasia, uh, which played the Beethoven's uh, pastoral symphony. So that's why he wanted to listen to, the, to, to this, and, and not because he did not believe in fate or things like that. So she also made things up. And then, but there was a fate after all, because there's a, um, uh, one of the most famous uh, Chinese composer today is a gentleman called Tan Dun. Um, and you may recall uh, he was the composer of the Academy Award uh, winning a film called uh, Crouching Tiger. And, and he decided to be a composer or musician after hearing that performance uh, on the radio when he was in middle school. So, so all these things are kind of interesting with this orchestra in China. All right. Um, so I would like to pause here before I move to the commitment to the community for the last 20 minutes of this, uh, uh, this room. Uh, any, any comments, any uh, view about the history, the character of this orchestra? It was great. Thank you. I, I don't have any questions. How about you, Maya or Frank? Well, I have no questions at the moment. It's just um, when you're telling the story about uh, the American diplomat and Madame Mao, I was thinking that probably that was, um, well, a way, you know, to, how do you put it, to translate different cultural and historical values in a sense. So maybe, you know, both sides made, made things up to a certain extent, but still, I think they understood each other too. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, so um, let me let me write, uh, uh, jump to the last part of this room, uh, this room uh, the commitment to the community and the commitment from the community. Um, the Maestro Savalish said this. He he pointed out the key differences between a typical European orchestra and an American orchestra. The, the European orchestras are supported by the government, uh, so they were to a certain extent they were the employers are the government, but but the the American orchestra is supported by the community donation over 70 percent i believe was from donation um, there's almost zero government fund so michael savage said that he he knows this is tougher for american orchestra but he likes the american system better because uh, what 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 happened is you are playing to your real audience not to the government and he feels more direct connection with the audience and uh, um and uh and and because of that financial pressure, the orchestra is kind of forced to continue to find new ways and in inventive ways to, to nurture its relationship with loyal patrons. And that's what we're going to cover uh, briefly in this, uh, in this last section. Uh, first of all, uh, there's a board director, uh, there's a board with the Philadelphia Orchestra. The board decides who should be the president of the orchestra and, and, and salaries of the, uh, the, the approve or disapprove the salaries of the, the, the players. Um, uh, music, uh, music director and also concert master, but the board directors are a kind of uh, selected by the community. When I came to Philadelphia in 1993, I made a donation. I think about 100 US dollars, and I was surprised to see I I had a, a letter uh, say you know from the board um, uh, from the board saying that uh, I have a choice to approve or disapprove the newly recommended directors. So it, it is really a, a community, everybody is involved, uh, everybody can express opinion to a certain degree about how the orchestra is managed or operated. And, uh, and also uh, some of my friends in, in Japan, they say that uh, in the orchestra, uh, she said that uh, uh, sometimes they are asked to go to play uh, some uh, classical music in front of the school kids. Uh, those people do not pay us. Um, you know, it's unfair. And, and I totally agree with that. Uh, in Philadelphia, it's also true. Um, the, they have to play in front of the, you know, in a community service center or wherever for free. But there's a difference because uh, the, the Philadelphia orchestra players are paid pretty well. Um, the console master, uh, well, I shouldn't reveal the number, but uh, it's actually a public information, but I, don't, I, I think I shouldn't say, say it here, but it's pretty well paid. So that salary, that high salary is not just playing in the Verizon Hall. 
it's also the community service that they were expected to do, which is part of the salary. So they, they won't complain about it. So I hope Japan as a country will respect more about the musicians. So they will give them better paid. And so these musicians will not, will, will not feel like they were underpaid when they are doing community service. Um, so that, that's an important distinction between the, the two system. And the, the orchestra has, um, has a, um, how do you call it? a motto, if you will. And it's called Our City, Your Orchestra. I mean, this explains everything. I mean, such a simple English, Our City, Your Orchestra. So the orchestra reminds the city that we live together in the city and we are your orchestra. And uh, so uh, what, what does this mean? I, you know, it sounds great, but I wanna give you two quick uh, incidents that I run into that I wanna share with you. Uh, that was in um, October 16th, and I can never, I will never remember, I will never forget this, uh, this incident. October 16th in 1999, um, there was uh, a famous Romanian, yeah, I think he's a Romanian uh, pianist called Ivo Pogorelic, Pogorelic, and he came to Philadelphia as a guest pianist. They played a rough line of uh, piano concerto number two. And for those of you who know this piece, it's a really beautiful piece. It's warm. And Philadelphia, again, play with the beautiful string, with warmth. But uh, Pogorelic was very, um, he tried to be eccentric. He will push back the music with very cold piano sound. So the warmth of the orchestra sound, he will return with, you know, really loud, I mean, really, I, I, almost grotesque, uh, interpretation of the piano play and so after that the intermission came and i went to a restroom and i you know there was a line then i saw the oh okay so after this concert after this performance there are many students boo him like instead of bravo they said boo boo it was like really loud you know criticism to the pianist so intermission came i came i went to the hall and i saw an old gentleman arguing with the students and it was interesting the the, the 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 old gentleman was lecturing the students in this way no matter how bad this pianist was he is our guest tonight don't treat our guest like that or something like that i, I thought that was really interesting i mean this is something you'll never see in new york i mean the, the audience uh, from all over the world but the audience in the philadelphia orchestra concert they feel like this is their orchestra Therefore, they feel the musicians today are a guest to my house. So even though they be ba behave ba badly, don't, don't do this to them. And, and that is a unique thing. You, know, you sit in the audience seat and then people around you, they are all Philadelphians. They support this orchestra uh, with the respect. And, and that's a, a special, uh, that's, that's quite special. And, and another example I'm going to talk about is 1994. There was a, a, a huge winter storm that hit the orchestra, hit the city of Philadelphia. And the, it was a Wagnerian night. Uh, so they invited some singers uh, from, from out of town. Uh, in, uh, they were staying in a hotel across from the ho concert hall. Um, and it, uh, it was, you know, uh, Die Vakur and, and uh, Tan Hoyla, all these uh, Wagnerian pieces uh, with orchestra and, and these singers. But the snow prevented the musicians to come to the hall. And uh, so they were about to cancel the concert, but then they decided to do something very unique. They said, well, the Maestro Savalish is a great pianist and it Maestro Savalish volunteer. It was his idea that I am going to be the pianist to play the entire orchestra part. And the singers are just staying in a hotel across the street so they can come in. So this opened the door to welcome all, all the, uh, the citizens who can walk to the concert hall to listen to this beautiful Wagnerian music. And that became the legendary Winter Storm concert, which is uh, still talked about today in the classical music circle. That was 1994. And so these are two of my favorite um, stories about it. Um, and then the community services, they are playing in all over the place, but there are two particular uh, places uh, that uh, on the YouTube that I would like to share with you. Uh, believe or not, they even go to the US citizenship and immigration services to play the music for the people who just became the US citizen to welcome them to America. And uh, uh, of course, not, not the entire orchestra will go there. Uh, uh, this particular video will show a Taiwanese viola and Chinese violin and Japanese-American cello uh, players 
uh, playing the uh, uh, Dvorak uh, Cabatina, which is a beautiful music to, to almost like uh, reminding you where your hometown is. And then the, the Chinese violinist arranged and transposed the viola part for the Taiwanese uh, viola player. So it is interesting in, you know, uh, Maya in our room, in, in the, our room, there's a, a geopolitics room, talk about the Taiwan, China, US, and Japan. But here, there's no, you know, what geopolitics, right? These uh, three uh, players are playing beautifully in the immigration service office. And that YouTube, uh, you can see, and I, I, I put up there on the link as well. And the other one um, is, uh, uh, is a cultural uh, center called uh, Taya Puerto Rico. Uh, it is the uh, cultural heart of Latino uh, Philadelphia, and uh, unfortunately, the Latinos' uh, population are still living in a in a, a less affluent section of the city. Um, so the orchestra members will go to this uh, cultural center and play uh, their music, uh, South American music. And in this uh, video, uh, you are going to see all Spanish uh, language program uh, played by a Japanese American bassoon player, and actually. Uh, he was uh, born in South America, and a Mexican uh, clarinet, and a Mexican French horn player, and American flute, American percussion players playing this uh, music in this um, in this uh, uh, Latino cultural center in Philadelphia, and it's 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 so well played. And then the the music was actually uh, arranged uh, for this uh, group by the Japanese American bassoonist. Um, uh, a great bassoonist um, and then the the I will continue to the education side of the initiative there's something called sound all around program that the orchestra will host uh, you know allow kids to to come and then it's more like a kids fan club of the orchestra they can see each orchestra player right in front of them and then listen to them talk about the story um, and what's amazing is um, when they traveled tour other parts of the world, they will send the postcard um, to the children back home. And so when, when my daughter was uh, a little, uh, was in, in, in elementary school, uh, I was surprised to see one of the violin players sending a postcard of Mount Fuji uh, and then saying, hello, uh, Isabella, and you know, things like that. Uh, we are in Mount Fuji. We just passed uh, Mount Fuji. We are on the way from Tokyo to Kyoto, and something. Like that. So this really captures the um, the young uh, kids' uh, kids' heart, and I think this is a beautiful way to continue to make sure that you have audience even in the future with a personal connection at this level, a personal postcard handwritten by the orchestra player to to the children in the Sound All Around Club. And I find it interesting because uh, I know Mount Fuji very well, and maybe the, the violin player knew that uh, Isabella's uh, father is from Japan, so maybe he picked a postcard. Well, uh, we'll never know, but we, thank, we still thank him. He, uh, uh, Isabella is, is maybe a little bit uh, um, influenced by, by him, uh, and he's, uh, she's playing violin also. And then there's something called Philadelphia Youth Orchestra, uh, which was established in 1939, very close relationship with Philadelphia, the real Philadelphia Orchestra. And um, I, I put up an example of this video, uh, playing the Leonard Bernstein's um, uh, West Side Story orchestra version of that, and there's an a, a, a interesting tradition called side by side. So if you are the concert master of the youth orchestra, and the real Philadelphia orchestra's concert master will sit next to you, sharing the same stand, and so these young kids, high school kids, uh, will have the opportunity to play next to a real great player and learn a lot from them. And but uh, this tradition does not stop there. Um, the, the another example I show there is you know uh, the German uh, composer called uh, Richard Strauss had a, um, a great uh, tone poem called Ein Helden Leben, which means a hero's life, and this music has a long, long violin solo section, like a violin concerto. And so the Philadelphia Youth Orchestra's uh, concert master has to play this. Um, sh uh, uh, sh I, well, it's actually my. For Oyabakade, Oyabaka, the parent, uh, brag him, he, he give me an opportunity to brag, my, my, brag a little bit about my daughter for a minute. Uh, she was the, Isabella was selected as a concert master, and then she had to play this violin solo. And that's when the interesting things happen. I follow, uh, I follow her to a, a, a training, which was trained by the legendary uh, Norman Carroll, which is, uh, who is the uh, 
a retired concert master of the Philadelphia Orchestra, and he played uh, the concert master role under Omandi, Muti, and Savalush. And I, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I mean, Isabella was trained by him, and he actually showed Isabella the score that he uses, and then let Isabella copy the score. Uh, copying what? Copying when to do the up bow, when to do the down bow, and and he he told me uh, that uh, you know he really doesn't like does not like people calling violin or viola string instruments because these instruments should be called bow instruments because fingering is easier than or should I say the bowing is more difficult uh, because it's it's about it's like human breathing the air um, expressive is coming from the bow, not from the finger technique. Uh, so he shared this bowing technique with Isabella, and Isabella basically played that part, the long solo part, um, the way uh, Norman Carroll played, and then that's when I realized this is how the Philadelphia sound tradition goes from one generation to the next. And then the, the, because of this training, the Philadelphia Youth Orchestra players were able to send uh, seven children, seven uh, players, uh, to be accepted by, uh, by the National Youth Orchestra of the USA, the un entire United States. Uh, I, I, I talked about this briefly in the last room, but uh, seven players out of... Uh, so, so the National Youth Orchestra, maybe there were 100 players. Seven out of 100 coming from one single youth orchestra is just just amazing, very astonishing. Because, you'll be, they, because there were some states that couldn't even send one kid to this uh, National Youth Orchestra. And the, among the seven, uh, seven players, the cello player from the Philadelphia Youth Orchestra, and he was, uh, I think he's a Taiwanese-American um, cello player, uh, high school, uh, Isabella's good friend. And he was accepted as the principal player at the uh, National Youth Orchestra. And they, they would play in Carnegie Hall, and then they would tour around the world. Um, so it's just, just a, a great way to uh, encourage uh, kids to, to do this. The Carnegie Hall concert uh, I, uh, is on the YouTube, I put up there for you. And you can see this principal cello player, this Taiwanese boy, um, a quite ha quite handsome boy, by the way, you should be able to identify him very easily, uh, playing Mahler Symphony Number no. 1. Um, and again, they, they, they went on after the world tour. Okay, I passed the an hour mark here. Uh, if you could uh, allow me to finish this in a couple of minutes about the donation and then friendly service, and I think uh, uh, we will end this uh, in maybe in two or three, uh, maybe within five, five minutes. minutes. Um, uh, sorry, I keep on talking when I start talking about the orchestra. Now you're doing fine, thank you. <laughs> thank Please, you. Yes. And don't worry so much about time, okay? It, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So, so donation. Um, a, a few examples of interesting donations. I mean, like I said, the, the, there's no government fund, so they have to be innovative about donation. And I pick a few examples here. Um, uh, there's something called chair. So each player is sitting on the chair when they're playing on the stage, right? In the back of the chair, you can put your name there, like Maya Matsuoka's chair, <laughs> to show that you support, you put, uh, you, you put a lot of money to support this orchestra and you want to be behind this particular player's uh, chair then to be uh, to be uh, to be placed there uh, that just to show your support and this is one way to do uh, if you click the uh, the bassoon the Japanese American bassoon players link above um, you can see um, he he right below his name he says there's a sense that this is who, who's, who's chair? So this is one way to 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 have donation to 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 motivate don, don, donors. And the there's a, there are many supporting organizations to donate the money to to find donations for the orchestra. And one of the uh, most uh, famous one and is the volunteer committees. I mean, everyone is a volunteer. And there, there's a, there are six districts. So imagine this: you have, let's say, Tokyo Symphony Orchestra, and you have Minato Ku, you have, you know, Shibuya Ku. Every Ku has a chapter, and each of them is, each of the chapter is so organized to keep on asking people for donation to support your orchestra. Uh, that's how how it works, and that's why this is uh, so uh, uh, efficient, effective, and they also have matching gift. So uh, once. 
once a while, a rich person will come up and says, I'm going to donate $2 million to the orchestra. But only if the volunteer committees or the orchestra members can find $2 million from other people. So people work really hard to find $2 million donation from, from anybody. And then, then the matching happens and then the rich guy will then donate his $2 million. So the total is $4 million. And then this is effective because the people, the normal people, average people like us, we know that if we donate $100, it will become $200. So it encourage people to donate more. And another program is they even accept stocks. Uh, let's say you have, I don't know, uh, Tesla stocks and you want to donate the stock as a gift, you can do that as well. And also they, um, they let the, um, the donors to travel around the world with the orchestra. This is the, uh, probably the most traveled orchestra in any orchestras in the US. Uh, the, in contrast, the least travel orchestra I told, was told is Boston Symphony uh, because the, the traveling, the world tour, you always lose money. <laughs> uh, but the Philadelphia Orchestra feels like they are the real ambassador, um, uh, cultural ambassador of the United States. So even though they are losing money every time they travel, they do that. Uh, but then, then the donor will support them and we'll, we'll go with them. And then I have an interesting 1958 European tour map. You can see the orchestra travel from one city to the next in, in an amazing schedule. And then um, when they tour in Japan, and I, again, I, I think that was 2016, and I happened to be in, in Japan as well. Is that like 2016? Or maybe, maybe earlier than that. Um, the ambassador to Japan was, uh, um, was uh, Kennedy. Um, Caroline Kennedy and the, the orchestras were the invited guests to the U.S. Embassy in Toronto. The orchestra member knew that I was in Tokyo. They were kind enough to invite me as well. Um, so we had, we all had a good time. And then, then a lot of Japanese people who were associated with the, the city of Philadelphia or the state of Pennsylvania were there as well. And then I saw my old good friends from uh, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Canada, Dr. Canada uh, from Carnegie Mellon University, which is not Philadelphia, which is Pittsburgh, but close enough. Um, and we took a, a picture together there and I, I posted a picture link there as well, if you care to, to see. Uh, that was shot in the US Embassy uh, during this uh, reception. So the orchestra is really the uh, cultural ambassador for the United States. Um, even though some orchestras do not travel as often, but Philadelphians feel that they have obligation to do this. And that's why they were the, also the, the orchestra selected by President Nixon to, to, go, to, to go to China. And, and the, um, uh, of course, the Philadelphia Orchestra or any music industry, this is all about service, uh, service sector, right? Um, so they offer some of the unique uh, services that I don't see in Japan's classical music um, uh, community. Uh, for example, free ticket change. I mean, people, and I can go to the concert tonight. I thought I could go to the concert tonight, but I couldn't go. So I want to change to a different day. No problem, free ticket exchange. And then the program notes is also uh, one of my favorite. The program notes I'll talk about, you know, today we're going to play this and that, but it does not only explain the program that we're going to play tonight. It also has the linkage to the historic events that took place. So maybe this composition took place at the same time the French Revolution happened, for example. Uh, and also other composers, literature, maybe uh, maybe Pushkin uh, wrote the, the, this uh, literature during the same era, and also the art events. So you can actually see the entire things, what was happening in the world at that time when I'm about to listen to this music. So this is uh, what, I call, what I call the, the experience, the history through the music. And, and this is very helpful. I learned a lot from, from reading these program notes. And then a few program notes are on the website. And I found one, so I put it there so you can see what I'm talking about. Um, and also community ticket. Oh, this is great. A community ticket, they always, the orchestra always reserves maybe around 100 tickets for those people who are, who are not as fortunate to be able to pay the ticket price to, to go. By the way, the orchestra's ticket price is much reasonable than the ticket price being uh, sold in, the, in Japan. But um, when I first came to Philadelphia in 1993, I was a young engineer, um, not very well paid. Uh, so I always joined this community ticket, which, is, which they start selling it then, uh, two hours before the performance. So I would go there two hours before the performance and wait in the line, wait in the line to get this uh, $10 ticket. And I think at that time it was $5. And, and you, can, you may get really good seat, whatever the leftover tickets, right? And what's interesting is, you see some homeless people, apparently 
homeless people in the line. So even the homeless people in Philadelphia, they like classical music, is what I found out. And I enjoy converse, conversation, talking to, to whoever I may run into in this long line for two hours, talk about many different things, including some of, uh, some of them are, are homeless people. Uh, so I, I would say the community ticket line is an, one, uh, uh, one opportunity for me to really get to know the people of Philadelphia from, from, from all different classes, I think. Uh, and so that's the, the, a few examples of the friendly service. And the, the final note on this one is about the crisis that uh, Maya, you, you mentioned, you touched base uh, at the beginning of this room. Uh, in, in, in 2008, we all knew what happened. Uh, Lehman Brothers um, shock, we call it uh, Lehman Brothers shock, uh, oil shock, maybe. Uh, maybe even greater a shock than the oil shock. And so since 2008, the donation um, amount started to decline. And in 2011, the orchestra did, uh, decided to do something that no other orchestra had ever done, which is to declare bankruptcy. And the reason bankruptcy was necessary was because of the Kako no Isan, Kako no Nimosu, the legacy, uh, you know, the, the contract with all many, many uh, organizations was too expensive. Uh, the, the only way to do that is to, uh, in Japanese we call it Kigyo uh, Saiseho uh, or whatever, chapter, I forgot which one, chapter 9 or chapter 11. Anyway, it's not really uh, bankruptcy, but really reorganization bankruptcy. Um, and it went on for 18 months. It, uh, this allowed the management to be able to renegotiate the contract with uh, many people, including the musicians, and the musicians were willing to pay, uh, to take the pay cut. Um, for example, I, I want to mention this, I mean, the, all the, the unions are very important, I support them, but sometimes the unions can be a little bit too much. For example, on the stage, you have a piano, right? The grand piano, you have people who move the grand piano to the stage and after the performance, they move the piano to the backstage. To do that, it costs almost a thousand US dollars for each movement because this is union, right? So um, it's just becoming too expensive and fixing the toilet in the Verizon hall costs you a million US dollars. So this was not sustainable by any organization, by any stretch. So they had to declare bankruptcy to renegotiate all, renegotiate all these terms and then come back. And they did that in 2011. Um, it went into re bankruptcy reorganization period for 18 months. But the, you know, the amazing things, amazing thing is the music never stopped playing. They never stopped playing the music. They, they would find different places, maybe in the school. In fact, the opening season of 2011, it was uh, played not in the Verizon Hall, but in University of Pennsylvania's Irvine Auditorium. And I show you that link there so you can see that uh, this great, okay, one of the greatest orchestra in the world had to be in this position to continue to make the mu make music. And that is quite moving to me. Uh, the musicians never gave up and then the communities continued to support them. And then they finally came out stronger than ever. And they wanted to do this because the Yannick the music, new music director was coming to town in 2012. They wanted to clean up all the, 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 the legacy uh, before Yannick came. And then um, it was quite emotional because there was still some cash left in the bank. So they didn't have to declare bankruptcy, but they knew this, they had to do something. Otherwise it's going to continue going downhill. So it took a lot of courage to do something before you think it's necessary. You know, a lot of people, a lot of management, they would do it only when you are about to fall down the cliff. But the Philadelphia management decided to do that much earlier. Um, so it was a split vote. And I was told and the board members, when they are voting to yes or no a bankruptcy, some board members had tears in their eyes because they knew this is going to hurt the Philadelphia orchestras. Uh, it is going to have a stigma that this is orchestra that went bankrupt once. But they thought that was the right decision and they took the courage to do that. And I think it was the right decision because the Philadelphia Orchestra came out really strong after that. And the, there was a um, PBS, uh, no, excuse me, not PBS, NPR, National Public Radio, talked about this uh, story. And they, I think they, I, I remember they, uh, uh, they praised Philadelphia Orchestra, the courage to do this because other orchestras in the US are also in, in financial dis distress. Um, I think the NPR even questioned that if other orchestras would be able to go as bold, uh, as, as, uh, as courageously as what Philadelphia Orchestra did. And, and I thought that was a, a very uh, heart a warming um, 
uh, comment from the NPR. Um, so this is an example of when the community and orchestra uh, management and players, when they were able to, to come together and take this issue as their own issues and help the orchestra to go through this difficult time. Um, it's actually a beautiful story, not a sad story that they had a bankruptcy in their record. Uh, and that will be the end of my discussion, uh, sharing my, my experience with this orchestra. Uh, I hope this has been useful to everyone. Um, and thank you again for the opportunity to speak about oh, my favorite orchestra. Thank oh, you. Thank you, Ren. No room is easier to moderate than this one. We just introduce you and then step aside and let you spin your magic. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Ren. Uh, to me personally, I mean, I love all the stories uh, you have, you know, you have prepared research and you, you, you tell us. But oh, it is also very important to note that there is always, um, well, a takeaway from every story you tell. And uh, yeah, I mean, for me today, what really is, uh, you know, stunning is how the orchestra went through all those um, hurdles and obstacles, the difficulty they had uh, through the, the years. And as you say, you know, they, they are now stronger than ever. So, but it is also, you know, I was thinking when you were talking about uh, uh, what the orchestra does, you know, uh, about their educational programs and how they uh, communicate with children and also how they um, uh, allow you to learn about history, not only in the United States, but also throughout the world through the music they play. I can imagine how much work goes into all these activities. And they still, the amazing thing is that the orchestra is willing to put all that work and the community, I'm sure that the community helps the orchestra a lot too. But that mutual trust, you know, of uh, if we do this, community will come back and help us. Community knows that if uh, all that work, then the orchestra will be back to just help them enjoy the music. So it's, I mean, it's a tremendous, I wouldn't call it a, a machine. It, it's not even probably an organization, but it's a tremendous amount of trust and willingness to work together, which is, I'm, I guess that's the way, you know, which we need to, to, to implement and to work in, to believe in, and to just on the way forward. Thank you very much for the inspiration and the, the story and all, all the, the things you actually, I mean, the list you put together for today's room again. No, thank, thank you again for the opportunity to talk. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, it's interesting. Um, I heard someone mention this. Um, wh why do we attend the live concert instead of, um, you know, recorded media? Um, you know, we, we, uh, we go to our museum to see the shapes of these great sculptures from Michelangelo and, and, you know, beautiful sculptures. But the orchestras, in a sense, they are shaping the music in real time, right in front of you. You cannot see the shape, but you can feel or you can hear the shape. So that's why every concert is unique. Um, depending on the audience, the orchestras and players are humans, they are not robots. They can actually feel tonight, tonight's audience is more energetic. <laughs> so the, the music shape actually changes and that's, uh, that's why we, uh, I, uh, people like us, we, you know, I do live streaming, but uh, I'm against live streaming. <laughs> I, I'm for uh, people to attending more and more in-person concerts and that's why I also feel Oh, this uh, COVID things will go away, and then this music, uh, all these art artists around the world can can catch a breath uh, someday. They are st still suffering every day, and uh, I miss the live liveness or live concert experience. Um, and okay, this is off the topic. Uh, this is uh, I think jump, I'm jumping jumping uh, off the topic, but. Uh, um, please support your orchestra in your community. <laughs> That's what I should say. <laughs> Yeah, my understanding is Japanese uh, orchestras are closer to the European models supported by the government financially more than being supported by the local communities' uh, don donations, which is always scary, right? You don't know, <laughs> which is really uh, 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 unreliable, should I say. You don't know how much people will donate this year. Yeah. But that, that creates uh, some kind of excitement in a different way. So you work harder to try to find... Uh, I think it'd be like fundraising every year. Yes. 
And I believe that, uh, you know, that uh, feeling of uh, uncertainty also brings a lot of uh, creativity and innovation. So, uh, because if you want to, 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 you know, to have a sustainable, to a certain extent, a sustainable stream of donations, you, you need to be invent inventive and creative. Yeah. Thank you very much once again for all the preparation and uh, the wonderful uh, presentation, Ren. Thank you for, for audience, uh, for coming to, I know this uh, year end, everybody's busy. So I really appreciate your, your coming to this room. Thank you for coming and staying with us today. We will be on air next week on Thursday at 8 a.m. Japan time, time again. So join us. Until then, you can find us at japanexpertinsights.com and our YouTube channel, where we upload all the conversations on Japanese politics, business insights, and the role of Japan in the Indo-Pacific region. If you want to stay informed about our upcoming events, you can follow us on Clubhouse, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. Again, we're looking forward to your joining us next week. Until then, stay well and make the best of the day. See you.